Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. I'm Adam, your co-host. A friend of mine sent me an article this week, and it talked about a suite of exploits called Pegasus. And it was in the Washington Post about how there was a wife of a political activist who received an iMessage from someone. And little did she know that iMessage contained the Pegasus malware payload. And it was a more sophisticated payload that was called a no-click payload where the malware actually deployed to her phone and she didn't have to actually click anything. And so this was my friend saying, Oh my goodness, iPhones are no, no longer safe. And you know, we stand no chance as infosec professionals against something like this. And if you haven't been really dug in in the infosec news, Pegasus is not a new tool by any means. It is something that's been around. It was discovered in August of 2018, but I think it's been in in development even years before that. And it's spyware that's developed by an Israeli cyber arms firm called the NSO Group. And it's specifically targeted for iOS and Android devices. And... Again, it's a suite of exploits, and sometimes it's a text, sometimes it's associated with a link or the Photos app or the Music app or iMessage. And not all of them are zero-click. Some of them you use a click to, to actually deliver the payload. But once it's installed, it can run arbitrary code, extract contacts, take a look at your call logs, messages, photos, pretty much the gamut of everything. And it's not even limited to other communication apps. And it got me thinking when I read this article because most of the time I like security policies that I am going to use when I think about deploying security policies in a company or when I think about scoping them, I think, am I going to want to use this device or be a part of this policy after it's been deployed. And prior to joining Microsoft, one of my friends had sent me a link saying that Microsoft was starting to deploy Defender for Endpoint to BYOD devices for iOS and Android. And the article broke down the technical aspects of how Defender for Endpoint works on iOS and Android, which includes a self-looping VPN. And there was a lot of pushback. I remember talking to you about it, Adam, about some employees not being happy about this being put onto their phones because a lot of people use their personal phones for this. And now you're supposedly putting a VPN, even though in the technical documents it talks about how No traffic actually goes back to the Microsoft servers. It stays isolated on the device itself because the talkback IP address is 127.0.0.1. But even for me as an information security professional, you know, there's a balance between productivity, privacy, and then security. And like we talked about it last week where you were against SSL decryption because you just felt that that was outside of what we needed to do. And some people disagree. Some people agree. Mm -hmm. But even for me, when I joined, I was thinking, well, I don't really want to put Defender for Endpoint on my personal device. So I chose to get a work device. And when I enrolled it in Intune, I didn't get Defender for Endpoint right away. And I asked you about it, and you're like, well, I think they're deploying it in phases because of the pushback. After I read this article, I thought, well, there's probably not 
any downside in having it on your phone as an additional barrier against these things. Now, I don't know if Pegasus can get around Defender for Endpoint, but I know that having Defender for Endpoint is, again, one more barrier for the bad guys to try to get past. So I went ahead and downloaded it on my work device and and signed in and activated Defender for Endpoint on my iOS device. So I just think that these things are important for defenders to think about when they're deploying things in a company. Yes, there's going to be pushback, but for me, after kind of reading the article and looking at the threats, I was like, well, this is something that I believe that would at least help me layer in my security because we always talk about defense in depth and having it there is better than not. So, You know, there's a lot to unpack here in this conversation, starting with kind of the initial sky is falling response from your friend who had forwarded you this link initially in response to Apple's iOS level security. And this is not the first time and it will not be the last time there are exploits like that on a mobile operating system, not to say that defends it or we shouldn't try to do better, but For the most part, these are really, really, really targeted attacks at VIPs or persons of interest. They're not used like as a general kind of attack. They're they're really, really targeted because the more this gets out, the more defenses will be put up against it. And so when it kind of floats under the radar and it's only used in targeted circumstances, there's less likelihood that Apple will be able to get samples of it and be able to determine how it's working and to patch it. So it, it, it's interesting from that perspective. I think Apple has earned the benefit of the doubt in their hardening of iOS. I think overall it's been really, really impressive. And I think iOS's security standing speaks for itself. It has been a really, really well hardened operating system and, Um, They've done a good job with that and will continue to do so. What I, what I think is also interesting about what I just said about how these attacks are used in such a targeted manner is that does go back to, you know, we kind of have these two schools of thought with information security where sometimes, yes, you absolutely do want to be paranoid and hardened against absolutely everything. And then there's sometimes where, you know, good enough makes you an unattractive target and destroys that return on investment for attackers and especially ransomware folks. So they're going to go somewhere else. And this highlights the fact that your VIPs of your organization, your C-suite and anybody else who has a really public persona, it's so important to get them to buy into these stronger security controls because they're the kinds of people that would be hit with this. And again, for something like it's probably like a buffer overflow or something is how they broke out of I message, but still having as strong of controls and possible as possible in place for those who would be hit with one of these super targeted attacks is, is important. And they tend to want to push back on them the most. At least that was my experience. And this continues to be a huge challenge for all of us in this space is getting them to understand politicians, um, journalists, VIPs of, of big business that this is so critical for them. They have to be more inconvenienced by security than the rest of us because they're such an attractive target. And then I think kind of the the third and last point here, Andy, going back to your conversation around um, not wanting to use something you wouldn't want to use yourself. So I do have defender for endpoint running on my personal iPhone. And for the most part, I was, relatively uncomfortable with it at first until I understood all the technical details. But the problem is like when you get into, like you rattled off the loop back IP address, 127.0.0.1, all of us technical folks who are listening to the show understand innately what that means. It literally, for those of you who don't know, it's how a device talks to itself. It's like, it's, it's your own name essentially. And so when you, when you send data to that address, it's never leaving the device, which is how Defender for Endpoint works. So every single call out your iPhone makes to any service, whether it's um, stuff you're using for work or not, is passing through this loopback connection. And it is getting in 
basically investigated by Defender for Endpoint and compared against a list of known bad host names or known bad IP ranges. And if it hits on one of those, then an alert is sent to Microsoft Security Operations Center and they do get that report. So that's interesting in that what, what could potentially be personal about that? It's hard for even me as a security defender to understand. Ultimately, I made the decision that I was just going to live with it and, and I reached a, a reasonable comfort level with it. But what bothered me more than anything um, or what I was concerned about is for my, my less technical peers, because like the concepts here are even hard to explain. And so I think that's a real, real challenge is um, not just deploying things we would want to use, but deploying tools we can easily explain. <laughs> I, I will say from my own career experience to use kind of an analogy, whenever I had a job where it was really hard to explain to people what my job was, it was not a good job. Uh, so I had a couple of stops in my past life where it's like, well, what do you do for uh, company X? And I was like, well, you know, sit down. It'll take me about five minutes to explain what I do. And if that's the case, your job probably sucks. <laughs> like, I'll just be honest. And when I've had great jobs, they've been straightforward to under explain what I do. What do you do at Microsoft? I sell security tools. Done. Okay. That's easy enough to big companies. Um, and, and so that's kind of the same thing here. Like if you can't explain to somebody at a really in, in 15 seconds, how a security tool works or how it protects them, then it might not be the right approach. And so I, I get what Microsoft's trying to do from a company. They're trying to prevent my iPhone from connecting to known bad host names or malicious hosts. And that is a good thing. And Apple has made that hard to do because there aren't really easy ways to link into iOS at a system level and accomplish that. So this is Microsoft being clever and finding the best solution to protect us as an organization. And I align with that goal completely, but the implementation is kind of challenging in terms of how to explain it, how it works. And even, um, even for technical people to understand, like it's a black box where you don't have visibility to validate. It does what it says it does versus a lot of other things where, that are, that are done really well, you can validate that it indeed works the way information security says it works. And when you can't, that's when it's kind of challenging. So I expect this will get better because I, I expect Apple will open up iOS in ways where third-party security vendors can slot into like the network stack and, and do this kind of inspection without doing like a loopback VPN. So it'll get better. Um, it's the best of a, of a challenging situation right now. And, and that's okay. I appreciate the hustle hustle and I appreciate the cleverness of the solution, but totally get why it's one of those where, you know, kind of a double-edged sword in terms of the implementation is kind of weird. It's kind of hard to explain, but it's, it's an, it's necessary and tying this all together when Andy was talking about the Pegasus suite of solutions and how this could potentially help you. Well, if some of those IP ranges have become known as command and control or um, reporting hosts, if the Defender for Endpoint VPN, which is not really a VPN, but you know, that's how it works, detects that the iPhone is trying to transmit something to one of those known bad hosts or known malicious hosts, it would block that connection from completing and raise an alert on your device. And so now this zero click attack that was attempting to harvest data from your device and offload it has now been caught in its tracks and prevented from proceeding. And you would only be able to do that through the solution like Defender for Endpoint has today because there's no other way to do it currently on iOS. And so that's where all of this kind of challenge and, and kind of like, eh, I don't love the solution. Like, like you said, Andy, when you view it through the lens of this particular attack, you go, okay, I still don't love the implementation, but I get it because it could potentially help in a situation like this. And that's, that's interesting to think about for sure. Yeah. And those command and control Domain names and DNS servers, they're, they're known. I mean, they're always trying to change them, of course, on the back end. But, you know, it's always a cat and mouse game. And so I'm sure 
Microsoft has that security intelligence. Mm -hmm. And the same thing with Apple. You know, they see these exploits and they try to bring up the security of every single version and inevitably just like jailbreaking, right? Like it comes out with a new version, it breaks the current version, and then people have to come up and redo the exploit or redo the the jailbreak. So um <laughs> It's so, There's always a cat and mouse. It's so weird to think about like jailbreaking was like, oh man, jailbreaking's cool. You'd want to jailbreak. And like today, the idea of wait a minute, there is a web page you can go to that will make your iPhone run unsigned code and will allow it to execute anything. Wait, what? We want to do that? Like that's that's a security exploit today. And so it's it's funny how much we've evolved since 2007. And that initial iPhone came out and we all desperately jailbroke it so we could play lights out. Yeah. And to Adam's point too, these are high value targets. I mean, the spyware is being used by nation states, Pegasus or not Pegasus, but the NSO group who uh, does and owns the malware. They made $240 million last year. And this Malware is being used by India, by Saudi Arabia, by the Mexican drug cartels, apparently, um, to target you know journalists, target human rights activists, um, the prime minister of Pakistan. I mean, so these are legitimate high-value targets. So it's not like your everyday person is going to get you know infected with this because the cost of getting the software from the NSO group is extremely high. The other thing is, is that it is tied to a phone number. So that's something interesting to think about because how often do you change your cell phone number and how often do you use your cell phone numbers for identification for MFA tokens, which we'll get into in the next story that we'll talk about. But you know, if you're a high value target, you may want to have an anonymized phone number or a trusted phone number that you're going to only do sensitive work on versus like kind of a phone number that's a throwaway that you're going to give to other people that you don't really care about. Um, so in our next story that I thought was interesting to talk about this week was there was an article in Bleeping Computer that talked about Twitter and the report that they released about their MFA adoption. And apparently only 2.3% of all active Twitter accounts have at least one 2FA factor enabled on it between the months of July and December of 2020. That is astonishing low considering how many accounts there are. And then on top of that, out of the 2.3% people percent of users who had 2FA enabled, almost 80% of that was SMS based. 30% was an MFA app, and only about 0.5% were using a FIDO key. So, you know, you talk about your phone numbers and SMS being the multi factor authentication, the threat of having a SIM hijacking is still very, very high. I had to call my service provider this week, and I thought about that as I was talking to him because when you call your service provider, they inevitably ask you for your phone password. And I can't remember that generally. I have it documented probably somewhere, but when they ask you, you're stumbling around, you're on the phone, you're trying to look up in your password vault. And so they're like, oh, don't worry about it. We'll authenticate you a different way. Give me the last four of your social and then some other information, which is all usually if you are very, very good at OSINT, you're able to track that stuff down. And so if you can authenticate, you can then swap your phone number to another SIM and get that sent. And that's how people do a SIM swap attack. And if you're using... MFA with your phone number, then they already have the token. And it's susceptible to attacks because it's a human factor, right? Like I'm asking you to provide me with information. You're going to make a conscious decision to authenticate me over some information that I'm providing to you. And that's all done through human factors. And that's all very susceptible to 
some sort of social engineering. So I thought it was really interesting because whether it's it's not a company, so to say, so to speak, but it is a good snapshot of what normal users have the appetite for when it comes to multi-factor authentication, even the easiest form, which is a phone number, only 2.3%. One other thing you did have noted here, Andy, is that despite the low level of adoption, it did at least grow by 9% from July to December, 2020. So when I saw you post this in the show notes, I had a couple of thoughts. First one is if you've ever signed up for a Twitter account, even recently, they never, ever, ever prompt you to set up two FA. It's something where you would have to intentionally stand up your account, go into settings and then go find like security And then go enable it. So unless you're already like security minded and you're thinking like, I want to do this, they never prompt you or ask you to do it. So Twitter, first off, could do a better job of nudging users to say, hey, you know, you should you should do this. Um, They also for the longest time, it's weird reading them kind of giving people a hard time for using SMS when for a long time, that was the only method Twitter had available. So I find that a little disingenuous that they were pretty late to the game to support uh, soft tokens, like through the Google authenticator app or Microsoft authenticator app. And uh, they, they still do not support FIDO two. I think it's still the U2F standard is what they support for hardware tokens, which is good, but not completely passwordless either. So, I mean, if we're talking about really getting with the program, where are you at with the password list, Twitter? So th- this is interesting. I-, I think this gives us an interesting data point from the perspective of for people who have no prompting, what is their tendency to go enroll in 2FA? And from that lens, 2.3% actually might be higher than I expected because, I mean, even two out of 100 people, and you know, there's all types of people on Twitter that are manually hunting down and going and standing that up might not be that bad without a little nudge. So of course I'd love to see them nudge a little more. I'd love to see them encourage non SMS methodologies, but at the same time, like you never want to go too far with that because yes, SMS has its known deficiencies. Yes. There is that human factor. That's the weakest link. And it's, it is a real threat. However, it's still way, way, way more secure than password by itself. And so, you know, do we need to try to move away from SMS as a second factor? Absolutely. I'm trying to conscientiously get rid of it in any place where I have it enabled as I detect it. Like I didn't decide I'm going to burn a whole Saturday, like signing into everything and finding where I've turned it on. But if I go through something, I'm like, Oh, that's still here. Yeah. Let's get rid of that. So, Some interesting data for sure. I I think ultimately the lesson here that can be learned is you do have to still kind of nudge people to do it. And most SaaS providers should get better at encouraging that behavior because it's not that big of a deal to do a little login interrupt when you're signing in being like, Hey, by the way, you should set up a second factor to really secure your account more. And some of them do that. And I'm trying to think of who's done it off the top of my head, because of course I'm signed it up, signed up for it on all the things, but I know some of them have been better than others at this, and and this is an opportunity for them to get better. So I don't know if there's a whole lot more to say than that, but definitely an interesting data point on the the uptake of second factor authentication and proof we have more work to do. Or maybe we should just go passwordless and skip this. I like that point that you made of different applications and service providers prompting people to do it versus for sure twitter does not prompt you i know discord you know has a thing when you sign in if you don't have your phone number or mfa enabled it'll have a little thing next to it and and funny enough for my kids they're playing Fortnite now Mm -hmm. and in order to buy something on the store or like sign up for one of their tournaments, you had to have MFA enabled Mm. for your Epic account. And so they wanted to sign up and it was like, please enable MFA for your account. I was like, Oh, okay. Well, that's nice. (laughs) They're using the carrot, which Apple does a ton of too. There's so many things with your Apple ID. You cannot do unless you have 
um, 2FA stood up for your Apple ID. Lots of stuff doesn't work, is not supported without it anymore. So they're using the carrot, which I like. So for our final talk point <laughs> tonight, Adam, you sent me this LinkedIn <laughs> post, which I thought would be a good conversation to talk about. So I'm just going to read it. It's from a cybersecurity strategist, and here's the post. It says, oh, my God, a loophole? Let's say you're a CEO and you underspend on technology and security by 50 to $100 million per year for five or 10 years. And then you have a bad breach, which costs you $400 million. What do you get? And the answer is a Ferrari because you saved the company $500 million and you got a cyber insurer to pay for your technology and security program. So I thought that that was comical (laughs) as well as probably somewhat true because there may be some CEOs out there who just think about the bottom line. Mm -hmm. And if you're not paying for something and then you get cyber insurance to pay for the breach and you saved a bunch of money and then you can use that money to buy security tools, well, I mean, you did save the company a bunch of money. But I sure hope there are no security people like CISOs who are thinking like this because, you know, this cybersecurity strategist actually said that, you know, he's been in meetings with CIOs, CISOs, and CEOs where they joked around about having more breaches because they actually get more money on the intrusion and they're able to buy a bunch of stuff that they're planning on upgrading. And while that may be true... I just don't think, I really hope that there are no defenders out there who think like that, you know, like do the right thing and actually protect the data and protect the company. I I just, I would never even think about intentionally underspending so that we would have a breach and then hoping that cybersecurity insurance would pay for it. And we've had conversations about how in the insurance industry is actually, probably readjusting their premiums now because there's so many breaches that are happening. And then the, the upside on, on, you know, how much money that they're making from that. And I think there's going to be an adjustment on the insurance side as well. But yeah, I just hope that uh, I thought this was interesting and, and I really hope that this isn't happening, but uh, you know, maybe have a conversation and see if, if that's a reason why, your company may be underspending. So I mention often on this show that I'm in security sales at Microsoft and we have what's called an incentive compensation plan. And it kind of lays out there's multiple buckets that have different weights to them. So like 25%, 30%, 20%, 10%, and there's different product mixes in them. And so you know, this, this bucket might be Azure security versus this other bucket might be E3 and this bucket might be E3 and E5 or whatever. And so what's interesting about that is, and salespeople have done this since the beginning of time is based on the way you design that compensation plan, you create and set behavior for the whole next fiscal year in terms of how people prioritize what they're going to do what they're going to go talk to customers about, what they're going to try to sell. So you can use incentive plan design to encourage people to go have a conversation of type X. Or if you get it wrong, sometimes you can disincent certain conversations from being had too. So one thing people in my role have noticed this year is that based on some of the changes to the plan year over year, there are some products that we're going to be less inclined to really talk about a lot because the the return on investment for us is going to be hurt by that. And that's what makes me think about when I read something like this, talking about the incentives for behavior. And I, I kind of opined on this in the show a couple of times about this recently, whereas when you had a really high profile breach several years ago, like Target and Home Depot, People still remember those breaches. Like even Joe Blow, like you can go to Joe Sixpack and say, hey, name a big retailer that got breached in the last decade. 
they probably can name Target for sure. And Home Depot probably pretty likely too, because they were really, really big attacks that were really well covered in the media. Today, like, hey, Andy, which of the three credit reporting agencies had a cyber breach? Do you remember which one? Experience. Okay. Okay. So you passed. But like, <laughs> I, I, honestly, so listener of the show, did you know, were you able to pick out Experian amongst Equifax and um, are you sure it wasn't Equifax? <laughs> Well, it might have been Equifax, actually. Yeah, you're right. I think it was. So there you go. Okay, thank you. I actually did prove my point. Or was it TransUnion? Who knows? Um, but the the point stands that like they've become less visible and less kind of seared in the the mental collective recently. And we're starting to see these ransomware stuff. Like people are going to remember Colonial Pipeline for a while, I think. But are they going to remember the next one as much or the next one after that? I don't know. And that's I think part of the problem is. It used to be there was so much reputational damage that came with a cyber incident that people were more scared of that than anything. I used to talk to customers where they could rattle off and say, we expect that if we were to suffer a security incident, we would lose 30% of our stock value, which costs, which costs this much to the company. Like they knew that number off the top of their head. And I don't know if that happens today. I don't know if you see a precipitous decline in stock value because of a cyber incident anymore, because of a security incident. And so I think that's where some of these financial incentives start to become perverse in that you can sign up for a large amount of cyber insurance. And if you do suffer a security incident, you get this windfall of money that just shows up on your front door. And it's more than enough to, and again, even if you're not paying ransom, right? If it's say that's disallowed at some point in the future, which, you know, I'd be in favor of, um, you could still have cyber insurance to pay for digital forensics, incident response, tooling, people, headcount, all those things to get you staffed up and more secure moving forward. And that becomes like you, again, you have these perverse incentives where um, the, the damage of the breach is not that high and you get this windfall of money from cyber insurance and you're no worse for wear. Like, and that's where this becomes really, really interesting. And, and there's a nugget of truth to this, which is why we brought it up on the show in that we want people to do the right thing. We want organizations to try really, really hard to protect themselves. We want them to, um, you know, be invested in securing themselves because we understand that a rising tide lifts all ships. If we start to have a bunch of organizations get knocked over, then the cyber attack groups, especially ones that are running ransomware scams, they start to make more money and become more powerful. It becomes that snowball effect where if we are all hardened across the board, then there's no money in it. And they'll go do something else and go bug somebody else. But right now they're having so much success. They're getting all these payouts. They're just growing bigger and bigger and bigger because there's money to be had and investment flows and people flow to the money. And that's where this becomes so concerning, where if everyone's acting in their own individual self-interest, where you go, Hey, well, from the bottom line of Acme Co, we're doing great. This was a good thing for us. Maybe so, but as an industry as a whole, we're, we're worse for wear. And that's where, you know, you start to wonder too, like, will we see some sort of regulation or government intervention over time? Because it, it can, like I was pointing out, you know, it can, it can grow in intensity and in danger. And that's, that's what a lot of people are raising the red flag about right now is that this kind of mindset, you know, forget everybody else. I'm looking out for just my company. Like that's, that's capitalism. That's what you're supposed to do. But that's where regulation comes in to make sure that we're doing what's right for everyone. And so I think that almost becomes that, that kind of poster child case for needing some sort of regulation or, or having some sort of requirements around this, because otherwise, if you have a bunch of organizations that are all acting in their own best interest continuously, it becomes worse for everyone. And that's, I think, the fear of this, where on the surface, it's funny. Yeah, you get a Ferrari. It is funny. But then you unpack it and you go, oh, no, you know, this, this is not good because there's a nugget of truth there. It's that uncomfortable truth. Like, it's funny, but it's like that uncomfortable funny. 
And I think that's what this mm-hmm. is. Yeah. And I think I do hope that there's going to be some sort of regulation. I hope it's not too heavy handed, but mm-hmm. the world is getting involved. I know that Interpol released some sort of report where it said, you know, ransomware is becoming one of the largest crime waves, you know, that the world has seen. And I even heard on a different podcast that ransomware groups or ransomware as a service in general, as an industry is becoming so successful that they're needing to branch out and hire negotiators, ransom negotiators and people who are specialized in not only talking to people and negotiating the ransom, but hounding them and making phone calls or doing threatening things. So they separated out the technical part and then the people part, and they're literally recruiting people to do that part. And, and they're seeking people who are bilingual. So if like you're a Russian ransomware as a service group and you need to translate to English to get your ransom, well, you hire a bilingual Russian speaking, English speaking translator who can negotiate that ransom for you. And that is becoming a job career path for people who wish to do that. And so it's definitely, I like your point where you're saying, you know, it, it's going to affect all of us in some way if people start thinking about this in their own self interest in the bottom line, because it's going to fund these ransomware as a service groups more and more. Mm-hmm. And they're only in it because of the money. So that's their incentive right now. And we have to somehow try to make them less successful so that they go away. <laughs> well, that's all I had for this week. Adam, any final thoughts? It was an interesting week in the news, which is just another week in information security. That's our show for this week. Thanks for listening as always. Our contact information will be in the show notes. If you have any topics or questions, please let us know. We'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.